Hello, everyone. Welcome to Agora. I'm your host, Gabriel Andrade, broadcasting from Maracaibo, Venezuela. And joining me today on the other end of the line is Professor Martin Daly. He is an evolutionary psychologist. He is the author of a very famous book, which is called Homicide, along with uh, Margot Wilson. And he's also the author of an upcoming book about homicide and inequality. And we're going to be speaking about this book and about his uh, past work. Hello, Professor. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you for speaking to me. Well, what's this upcoming book about? Well, the upcoming book is about the idea that income inequality, I think the, the unequal distribution of income, um, seems to be the best single predictor of homicide rates when people make comparisons across countries or across regions within a country or between cities and trying to understand why that is and trying to confront some uh, some questions about it. Well, I mean, it seems like common sense that if someone has something that I don't and I desire that thing, I will get it through violent means. But I guess that's, that answer is too simplistic. <laughs> Could you elaborate a little bit more on, on why inequality is a good predictor of violence? Well, I, I think the reason, it's certainly a good predictor within the variability that prevails in rich countries. And I think a lot of the reason has to do with the fact that where economic resources are evenly distributed, um, people are not as competitive. They're not as, as inclined to, um, you know, to, to enter into dangerous competitions as where resources are highly unequally distributed. If, you know, if you're a Norwegian and everybody has pretty much the same as everybody else, what is there to compete about? And most, most homicides, at least in the rich world, um, are pretty clearly about competition between young men, sometimes competition for money and um, direct resources, but even more often competition for social status in a, you know, in a underclass milieu where social status is perceived as the most valuable resource a poor man has, and it's maybe going to be translated into access to to money, access to a drug route, access to girlfriends. Right. So is this reaction to inequality in our genes, or is this something that is culturally built? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not happy with the distinction. I mean, I think that uh, people, like other animals, are sensitive to relative social standing. Obviously, the social milieu you're in tempers that teaches you what social standing means, um, what, its, what its utility is, or what you can do with it. Um, so, you know, in a context in which differential social standing is both um, available to people who strive for it and also clearly has consequences, then people might be more competitive in the pursuit of social standing than in some other milieu where that's not the case. On the other hand, I think you know, people like many, many creatures, um, their sensitivity to social standing is something that has evolved. It's something that, uh, you know, awareness of where you stand relative to others, not merely interest in your own immediate material well-being, but whether somebody else is getting something that you're missing out on seems to be something that human beings are sensitive to. <laughs> All right. And what are the policy implications of your work? I mean, should, should we be socialists in order to be more peaceful? Um, I think in general, there's something to be said for that claim. Certainly the, uh, the idea that, uh, that opportunity for advancement has to be widely distributed, but that's not always enough um, that, that uh, you know, People, people who um, who institute policies of sort of extreme opportunity for for wealth aggregation at the top um, that they're not they're not doing they're not doing the, their country any favor in terms of the likely consequences for what goes on at the bottom. 
Right. Now, I find this a bit ironic because uh, back in the day when sociobiology came out with uh, Wilson's famous book, uh, there was the accusation that uh, evolutionary psychology and sociobiology and Darwinism in general was an ally of the right. And, you know, uh, this came mostly from leftist critics. I, I remember a book by Marshall Salins, which was called uh, Use and Abuse of Biology. And one of his claims there was that, you know, all you evolutionary psychologists were actually, you know, friends of capitalism and patriarchy. And uh, it was a way to justify inequality. But on the other hand, here is a book by a prominent evolutionary psychologist such as yourself saying quite the opposite, saying that, you know, that Darwinism actually informs the view that uh, inequality not only is it good, but it may also be natural. Do you find that ironic yourself? Well, I, 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 I was always annoyed and baffled by that criticism. I mean, I've been in this racket a long time. My background is in non-human animal behavior. I was a sociobiologist, I suppose, before Ed Wilson's book came out in the mid-1970s. And most of the people I know in evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology, like most academics, um, their politics have always tended to be somewhat left of center, um, on average, statistically. And certainly the idea that, uh, that you know, an evolutionary mindset lends support to reactionary politics has always struck me as kind of crazy. I mean, there's, you know, one of the foundational principles of an evolutionary perspective on human behavior or any other animal's behavior, for example, is that because every, every person has a male parent and a female parent, and because the male sex contributes as much and no more and no less, um, to future progeny than the female sex, that therefore organisms value in the aggregate, they should value their male offspring and their female offspring equally. That evolutionary biology gives no remit for anybody to value one sex over the other. And likewise, um, one of the sort of foundational ideas in my field as I see it, um, Bob Trivers' theory of parent offspring conflict was sort of taking the position that. Um, the young are manipulated by their adult, by parents perhaps, but that the young are valuable and their perspectives and their perception that sometimes um, the social order as run by their elders is stacked against them um, should be taken seriously. And so, you know, a lot of people like Bob Trivers and, and many others um, in in sociobiology and human sociobiology were actually pretty less radical in many ways. Right. I want to go back to the, the thesis of your upcoming book about uh, homicide and inequality. Let's consider some possible counterexamples. Uh, let's take the case of Venezuela, <laughs> or the country yeah, where our, our audience is listening. You may not be familiar with our country because, I mean, it's not a very prominent country in the world, but let me update you real quick. Uh, Fifteen years ago, we had a socialist president, and ever since, that's been the government, and there has been some major wealth redistribution, and this has been certified by the United Nations and, you know, other world war institutions. But on the other hand, crime has dramatically risen. Would that be a counterexample of your thesis? Yeah, no, I, I, there's no question that a case like that is initially puzzling to somebody like me. I mean, it's puzzling to somebody like me. It presents challenges. And, uh, yeah, I know less than I wish I did or should about Venezuela, given that I'm speaking to you. Um, but, uh, but I'm certainly aware of the fact that, uh, that you know, whatever, whatever else the Chavez government may have accomplished or failed to accomplish, they do seem to have... Uh, greatly reduced inequality, um, economic inequality, and, uh, and, and moved Venezuela from being um, sort of middle of the pack in Latin America for extreme inequality to being one of the most equitable, perhaps the most equitable country in Latin America. I'm aware of that, and I'm aware of the, uh, the rises in crime and, and violent crime. Um, and I think it highlights a couple of points. One is that 
although income inequality and homicide tend to be strongly correlated when you make comparisons across countries or across cities within countries, um, inequality performs much less well as a predictor in so-called longitudinal analyses when you're measuring year to year to year to year. And that's not just true in Venezuela. You have uh, a phenomenon, for example, in the United States that's well documented is that the homicide rates fell through the 1990s while income inequality was rising. So it's sort of the opposite of the case you described for Venezuela. And, and that certainly is a challenge to, uh, to the notion that inequality per se is, is an important uh, source of violent conflict. I think, I think there's a couple of things to be said about that. One is that these things don't move in lockstep because the effects of inequality, insofar as there are pernicious effects of inequality, they're not immediate necessarily. I mean, certainly people confront inequality in their face, but also children who are raised under highly inequitable circumstances, people who perceive um, the world to be loaded in favor of some and not others may develop sort of dangerous life trajectories or a willingness to use violence as young people that isn't just going to disappear because the uh, the index of inequality has dropped from one year to the next. And so you have to look for lagged effects and effects that, you know, of the social and economic milieu within which people were born and raised on their behavior years and in some cases decades later. So so the impact of reducing inequality may be delayed. Right. I think that I think that's one important point. But another of course is that inequality isn't the only thing. And other stuff in Venezuela may very well have been undermining some of the possible benefits. I mean, I know, for example, that you have suffered from severe inflation at times in the last few years. Um, and this has got to undermine people's perception of, you know, the security of their futures. It's got to exacerbate the willingness of some young people, at least, to, you know, resort to dangerous um, dangerous tactics in their in their pursuit of some kind of uh, social status and economic well-being if if people you know if people think that what they've got now is unstable and insecure then they tend to become very present oriented and I think present orientedness is another predictor or another correlate of willingness to use violence you discount the future you say you know like I can't afford to you know, keep my nose clean and invest in the future because who knows if there's a future? And I of think course. you've had, I think you've had big problems in that regard in Venezuela. Am I right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, you say you don't know much about the country, but you have given a, a very apt description. So you're basically saying that for in order to for this relationship between uh, homicide and inequality to, to build, it takes time. It's long term. Let's consider some long-term possible counterexamples. I'm thinking here of your colleague uh, Steven Pinker's uh, recent thesis, according to which violence has been in decline not only in the last few decades, but actually in the last few centuries. Now, one could make the case, and you will tell me if I'm wrong or not, but one could make the case that with capitalism, there has been greater inequality. So in that case, it would be a counterexample of your thesis, even in the long term. Well, well, certainly, certainly, Steve Pinker is skeptical of the thesis, but again, more on the sort of short-term, you know, U.S. in the '90s kind of uh, kind of argument. I, I, I mean, I think you are wrong to suggest that uh, that inequality has increased on that same long time scale that. Uh, homicide rates and violent crime have apparently decreased or have certainly decreased in Western Europe and North America anyway. Um, you know, Pinker's book documents, I think, fairly convincingly and, and not not originally. Uh, other people have documented that that the homicide rates in Western Europe, um, say, three, four, five, six hundred years ago, were probably higher than the ones prevailing in Honduras and Venezuela now. Um, and that they have come down fairly steadily. But the inequitable distribution of, of wealth, certainly, um, has come down too, even, even despite 
um, capitalism's creation of billionaires, um, a few hundred years ago, there was a huge class of people who had negligible income and no security and a huge, or I should say a small class of huge property holders. And um, wealth is more equitably distributed now than it was in the 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th century. And I think, I think it can be documented, although I can't off the top of my head point you to this. Right. I think it can be documented that income inequality was higher in the 18th century than in the 19th and higher in the 19th than in the 20th and, uh, you know, has, with bumps, certainly, has mostly been on a downward trajectory. What's dramatic to us is the upward trajectory again since the Second World War that, you know, I mean, things were things probably reached their most equitable in the rich countries um, after the war and in the 50s and early 60s, and then inequality started to rise again. But it still only got back to about what it was in the early 1900s and is still way below what it was in the 1700s. Of course. Now, you say that uh, if we're unequal, there is more competition, and, you know, that leads to more violence. I have gone to countries like India, and, you know, they have the caste system there, which is, you know, severe inequality, not necessarily in economic terms, but at least in other terms. And one yeah. argument that you hear from Indian traditionalists is that, well, if everybody has a place in a hierarchy and everybody knows their place in society, there will actually be less violence because there is less to compete about. So let's say that in the feudal world, you know, the Lord uh, had his place and the peasant has his place. And, you know, they each know where they belong and there is less competition. Whereas if there is equality, we're all on the same level playing field and there is more competition. So, you know, traditionally yeah. Indian scholars have usually said that e e equality can actually be quite dangerous. Well, I, yeah, I understand the argument and I think there's probably something to it. The idea that people have some perception of what pool they're in, what competitive pool they're in. And if it's if it's absolutely unthinkable that uh, that you know you could achieve the the wealth and status of a Brahmin, um, then you're in competition with the people at your level, and the inequality in your caste becomes almost like the inequality in your species. Um, when there's mobility, there certainly opens up the opportunity for dreams of mobility and dreams of wealth accrual. Um, and so presumably opens the, opens the door to people in, becoming more competitive in their tactics. Um, I mean, that, that, that makes some intuitive sense to me. At the same time, I think you have to have um, a pretty authoritarian power structure and perhaps some pretty heavy policing to keep the lid on the potential for disgruntlement of the people at the bottom. When you have large numbers of people who are poor, um, it's partly a matter of are they aware that somebody else is making out like a bandit and they're not, you know, have, have they, are they cognizant of the fact that somebody has wealth? And then is, is it conceivable to them that, uh, that, that some of that wealth could be theirs? And, you know, I do understand, I, th I think there's probably some truth to the idea that one successful strategy for keeping on the lid on violence is convincing the poor, that the situation is hopeless and equitable in their class. Right. Uh, what about polygamy? You uh, approach it in your book, and I found it to be very interesting. You know, this idea that uh, the more polygamous a society is, the more violent it may become. Why is polygamy related to violence? Well, I think polygamy is related to violence because it's related to competition. I mean, um, across different animal species, you tend to see that uh, the more polygamous the breeding system is. Um, I'm, well, let me quantify that in a, in a sort of crude sense. I mean, if you know, if you have in some animal species, let's say um, many South American monkeys are monogamous, one male, one female raise the kids together. But then there are also species like um, who howlers um, and some other kinds of monkeys in which. A few males mate with many females, and a lot of other males lose out. 
And in those kinds of societies where a few males are successful and are siring the young of many females and others are losing out, you tend to have a lot of competition for the high status male positions, obviously. And you tend to have a lot of male mortality from fighting. You tend to have the evolution of male weaponry that the females don't have. In the monogamous species, you tend to have males and females, like, a, like say, a marmoset or something, you tend to have males and females are very similar in body plan, they're very similar in the degree to which they fight with each other of their own sex, and they're very similar in their mortality schedule. So where the, spe where the species is more polygamous, you tend to have males more weaponed, more um, aggressive, and having higher mortality than females. And I think it's pretty clear that the human animal evolved under conditions of slight polygamy, not extreme polygamy because males help raise the kids, but some guys monopolize a few women in most sort of non-state societies, so-called primitive societies. And, you know, it's, it's, there's been a little bit of controversy. It's hard to collect good data because, because usually the population sizes are very small and the information is poorly documented. But there's pretty good anthropological evidence now that if you look just at hunting and gathering societies, or even if you look at um, horticultural societies in Amazonia and New Guinea, that you tend to find the more extreme the polygyny, the higher the homicide rate, the higher the number of violent deaths. Right. Death, I mean, homicide versus warfare is kind of a fuzzy boundary in these non-state societies. But uh, but men are by, the violent death rates of men are positively correlated across societies with how polygamous the society is. And and this makes a certain amount of sense to me, just on the grounds that where things are highly polygamous, there's something serious to compete for, namely being one of those top guys who gets to have several wives and lots of kids and lots of grandchildren. And 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 there's a the bottom out is large numbers of males are going to die without issue. They might as well be dangerous um, because otherwise they're complete losers. Right. How much of a factor do you think this accounts for Middle Eastern violence? I mean, I find it very intriguing that, you know, the martyrs are promised 70 virgins. Now, that makes a lot of sense with the evolutionary theory and what you're saying. I mean, if, if they can leave descendants, uh, one way to hook them up is to invent this fantasy where they will have a lot of descendants, not in this world, but in the next world. Uh, and of course, the Middle East is well known for, you know, polygamy being allowed in Islam. Do you, do you think polygamy is a big factor in all the troubles going on there? I don't know about a big factor. I think certainly, um, you know, the rhetoric you're talking about is interesting in the shadow of the opportunity for polygamy. I, I you know, I, I don't know a huge amount about the original spread of Islam, but I understand that um, part of the reason the Arabs were successful in you know, a relatively small military force spreading their religion across North Africa in particular, but perhaps elsewhere, was because actually part of what they were preaching were limits on polygamy. You could only have four wives, and they're going into societies where guys were monopolizing many women. Then ironically, the Muslim leaders themselves inherited this practice of having only four legitimate wives, but having harems full of concubines in Morocco and other places. Um, so, you know, the, the polygyny of those societies historically surely created a large underclass of males who are potentially dangerous, unmarriageable, you know, um, and you had to do something with them, sometimes um, draft them into the army and send them off to seek, seek their fortunes elsewhere. But, uh, but there's that history. And I suppose, you know, when you talk about the 70 virgins and things like that, I mean, perhaps that's a sort of rhetorical legacy of a situation in which, you know, men, and, men are cognizant of, of competition for access to multiple females. It's kind of, it's kind of, and I don't know how seriously anybody takes this. I mean, can, can people really be motivated by the thought that uh, that they will have multiple partners in the afterlife. It's, it's so alien to me. It's so alien to me that I find it hard to believe. Well, I mean, I, I wonder, aren't you being ethnocentric? I mean, you're... Uh, 
possibly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, Sam Harris has this uh, famous claim that if you compare Palestinian Christians with Palestinian Muslims, I mean, they have both suffered the same amount, but it's the Muslims who are blowing themselves up, not the Christians. So, I mean, maybe those seven virgins might have something to do with it. But anyway, how does, your, how does this book relate to your famous work on homicide and, you know, the Cinderella effect? And the fact that uh, whenever there is a homicide uh, and there's a, a conspiracy of people to commit murder, usually the members of the conspiracy are uh, keen related and, and all those famous claims that you made in, in your previous book. Well, I didn't know they were famous, but anyway. Um, well, I mean, the, the common core, I suppose, is um, it's my conviction, my perception that. Uh, that it's useful to think of human motives and emotions as having evolved and to try and understand human beings in some sort of comparative perspective where you ask, um, you know, how are they similar and how are they different to, to, to other species and where do we reside on dimensions like the dimension from um, having evolved under strict monogamy to having evolved under extreme polygyny, that those kinds of, uh, insights about, to use the phrase, human nature or the nature of the human animal um, should should inform the way we investigate how how people interact with one another and what conflicts are about. Um, why do people come into conflicts? Why do those conflicts become potentially lethal sometimes? Um, you have to have, if you say, why, if you want to understand conflicts of interest between people, you have to have some theory of what interest means. And the idea that our interests have evolved to be proxies for our eventual reproductive success, um, I think, is a very helpful insight. Um, and that that continues across um, everything I've done on homicide in the last 30 years. Well, Professor Martin Daly, thank you so much for taking this call. When can we expect this book to be out? Gosh, I hope um, reasonably early next year. All right. We'll, be look, we'll look forward to it. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Indeed.